Let me begin by extending our condolences to the friends and family of those South African citizens who've lost their lives to COVID-19. Our thoughts and prayers are with all of you at this difficult time. Fellow citizens, on Saturday, we reached the 100 day mark since our country went into lockdown. This is a long time, and I'm sure for many of you, it feels even longer. But the truth is we are still in the early days of dealing with this virus. Even with the world's best scientists working day and night to develop a treatment or a vaccine, it could be another 18 to 24 months before this becomes available. We have to learn to live with the virus as safely as we can. Whether we like it or not, we're in for the long haul. And this long haul cannot be a life under lockdown. If people are to survive, our country needs to function every part of it. We simply don't have the reserves and surpluses that many other countries do. Each little compromise in our economy will put thousands of more people out of work and in extreme danger of poverty and hunger. Our efforts must now go to being economically active while doing all we can to avoid becoming infected. And I don't mean that our economy should function as it did before. We need to do far better than that. Because even before COVID, the writing was on the wall and millions had no hope of finding work. We cannot go back there. That's not the benchmark. If we're talking about a new normal, let it be one of raised expectations and of goals worth pursuing. Let our new normal be a brand new paradigm for our country. Let's use this opportunity to flip the script and walk away from the failed project of centralized state power and give more power to the people of South Africa. Let our new normal incorporate all the long overdue reforms that the president and the finance minister have been talking about, but can never seem to implement. This is our opportunity to do so, so let's do it right. We've already adjusted to so many new things in our lives these past three months. We should have no problem getting used to more changes. Is South Africa without SAA, or one in which Eskom doesn't hold a stifling monopoly? We'll easily adapt to the new normal of flexible labor laws and a trimmed down public sector. Let our new normal also include a state that is actually able to deliver because it is staffed by the best and not by political appointments. If we're using this opportunity to recalibrate and reset the clock, let's do it properly. But all of this is going to require real leadership. And that's something we have not seen from our president since that first announcement 100 days ago. We've seen a lot of muscle flexing from ministers around meaningless regulations. We've seen plenty of force and brutality used against our citizens. And we've seen inexplicable decisions that have caused untold harm to our economy with no measurable impact on the virus. We have seen ministers rightly and repeatedly slapped down by our courts for abusing their power during this crisis. But we are yet to see leadership from the one man who really matters. Throughout all of this, as rogue ministers of the National Command Council compounded our problems with petty regulations, as our hospitals filled up and our economy imploded, President Ramaphosa has been little more than a spectator. We needed someone to step up, to take charge, but what we got was a president obsessed with dialogues, reaching out and building consensus. And this has been the very story of his presidency to date. A lot of talk, a lot of promises, but very little action or leadership. Going into this crisis, he had all the public support he needed if he truly wanted to be bold, but he has squandered it. Martin Luther King once said, a genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but a molder of consensus. We desperately needed the latter, but we got the former. And that's not what you want when your country is facing a devastating double blow of a healthcare and economic crisis. But thanks to this dithering, we now have a third crisis, a political crisis. Because while our president has been watching it all unfold from the sidelines, others have been very busy, most notably Cogta Minister in Korsazana Dlamini Zuma. 
Since the declaration of the state of disaster, the unchecked power handed to the Cogta minister has made her our de facto president, and she has wasted no time digging herself in. We've already seen multiple commitments made by the president on live TV, and done a couple of days later by Dlamini Zuma. Her stubborn refusal to reverse a cigarette ban is her way of letting the president know exactly who is in charge. And consider this, she has the power to extend the state of disaster indefinitely. But even that is not enough. This week, a top secret document was leaked to the DA in which the Cogta department put forward several extremely concerning ideas about how they think the country should function. At the heart of this document is a proposal to extend government's centralized command council system well beyond the COVID-19 crisis and to include provincial command councils. Simply put, it's a bold play to try and centralize provincial and local government power in the hands of a few. To call this unconstitutional would be an understatement. It is tantamount to a coup, as it attempts to put unelected national politicians in charge of provincial and local government functions against the wishes of those who voted for these governments. This is the RET faction of the ANC showing its hand against the Ramaphosa faction, and they feel comfortable to do so because they recognize weak leadership. They are using the COVID crisis as a cover to pull the rug of government from under the president's feet, and he seems incapable of stopping it. And all the while, while our country's economy and health care are imploding, as we head to the really big COVID numbers across South Africa, when infections in the Western Cape were rising faster than anywhere else in the country, there was much talk of sending in the big guns and even threatening the province with a return to hard lockdown. But now that the provinces like the Eastern Cape and Gauteng are collapsing, national government is strangely silent. What happened over the past months in the Western Cape has been extremely traumatic and challenging. And the province is not out of the woods yet, not by a long shot. But the numbers show that the interventions there appear to be working. Infections are slowly leveling off, and hospitals, while full, have not yet been overrun, as we've seen in other parts of the world. There is no doubt, thanks to the preparation of the provincial government, we know what they did to raise the line in terms of the hospital capacity because they constantly showed us. We saw new field hospitals at the CTRCC, Kailicha, Brackengate, and other locations. We saw an increase in intensive care and high care beds and oxygen and ventilator availability. We knew at all times where and whom they were testing in order to try and contain local transmission. In other words, we saw what this provincial government had been doing since the day they became aware of the looming crisis. But elsewhere, we've seen almost nothing. No one knows how the past 14 weeks of lockdown were spent reading the Eastern Cape hospitals for the imminent wave of COVID cases. No one knows how many extra beds Gauteng has prepared. We haven't seen their field hospitals. We haven't seen their ventilators and their oxygen tanks. And we've seen even less from places like KwaZulu-Natal, Limpopo and Mpumalanga. What we have seen from these provinces is patients fighting each other for oxygen and entire hospitals being closed down. Can you imagine how distressing all of this must be for those who are vulnerable and in high-risk categories? And why are we in this position in July when we should have been preparing since March? The whole purpose of the lockdown was to try and hold the virus outside for just a little longer so that we could get these things in order. South Africans were asked to sacrifice all they had for this sole purpose. What can you possibly say to people who've lost everything in the lockdown, if it turns out they did it for nothing? What do you say to vulnerable people, the elderly or those with comorbidities, in places where the system clearly cannot cope? But even more importantly, what will our president do about it? President Ramaphosa, if you're in charge and not Minister Dlamini Zuma, they need you to stop being a spectator to all of this and step up to the plate. Our country needs you to do better. Don't be too proud to ask for help and advice from those who've already been through it. 
the experience of the Western Cape provincial leadership these past few months should be of immense value to the rest of the country. Given what we're seeing with the numbers there, surely these are the strategies we should be replicating across the country. Speak openly and clearly about your plan. People need to know what's in store for them. They need to plan accordingly. You must play open cards. Businesses can't possibly operate under chaotic regulations and with the threat of re-entering a hard lockdown hanging over their heads. When it comes to spending money to build prevention and treatment capacity, nothing is too much. Money must not be the problem here. Held up against the vast amounts that have been spent on bailing out SOEs like SAA and now also bailing out the failed ETOL program, the cost of raising the healthcare line and program is not that high. Cut those other things and let's spend where it matters. We also need to make far better use of the expertise that exists in the private sector. Government is not in this fight alone. There are many experts out there who are willing to help get the testing and prevention efforts back on track. Government needs to reach out to them. But above all, you must be rational when dealing with the crisis. Don't allow factional battles or ideology or egos to get in the way of common sense. We know that given the perilous state of our healthcare, we cannot rely on treatment to safeguard us from the virus. And so we really need to up our prevention game. We also know far more about the airborne spread of the virus than we did three months ago. And we must advise citizens correctly. One of your most important jobs, Mr. President, is to tell people how to best protect themselves. It is crucial that people always remember the three most important things that infect their chances of becoming infected. Their distance from an infected person, the dose of the virus which they get depends on the time spent near this person, and the degree to which the virus is dispersed in the air. Whatever we allow in terms of gatherings or socializing has to take these three Ds into account, distance, dose, and dispersal. In other words, always try and maintain distance. Try not to stay close to people longer than you have to. And most importantly, keep air moving by being outdoors or having the windows open. We know that gatherings of people are super spreaders. And we know this is far worse when it happens indoors. So let's take our small gatherings and our socializing outdoors wherever possible. And this means lifting the irrational ban on beaches, parks, and other outdoor places. Let's always wear our masks where necessary and wash our hands frequently. And let us encourage those at high risk to remain in voluntary isolation until it is safe. And this includes respecting the safety of employees with comorbidities as we return to work. These are the things we all can and must do to ensure our own personal safety. What you need to do, Mr. President, is to take charge. Use your position and the support you still have to fight for the safety of our citizens. Always put them first. If the choice is between ETOLs and hospital beds, choose the beds. If the choice is between SAA and a comprehensive testing strategy, choose the testing. And if the choice is between your party and your country, always choose your country. This is the duty of the president. And right now, our country needs a president and not just another spectator. Thank you very much.